This week's episode of Modern Art Family Tree is brought to you by the Foster Gallery. The Foster Gallery is a gallery in Worcester, Massachusetts, who specializes in paintings, drawings, and prints. Find them at www.thefostergallery.com. Uh, okay, and we're we're on. So, all right, hi everybody. This is Matt Foster, and this is the Modern Art Family Tree. I'm joined again, as I am every week, by my good friend Dennis Hart. How you doing, Dennis? I'm doing well. How are you doing? Not bad. Not bad. Are you getting ready for the snowstorm we're supposed to get? I, I, it's been majorly downgraded from what I understand. Oh, really? Where you guys are, it has been? I believe so. I think we're only supposed to get like three to six inches or four to eight inches. Not a, oh. not a whole lot. Well, that's good news to me. The last I heard was like a foot, and I was not, not real thrilled about it. <laughs> I, I think it, most of it's gone off to sea, so there's only another piece of it that's coming through. and. That's oh, good. We may want to try to clip this first part of the... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, right. And then watch it be like the worst snowstorm ever, right? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I believe that. What I heard this morning was like minor, and oh. I think I'm even still in the north, north and west of Boston. is supposed to be like the worst of it, and I still only saw like three to six or four to eight inches oh, for us. Well, that's that's good news for everybody, especially after the last one we had. Yeah. So, so today we're getting into. What, what I would call like the, the, you know, we're moving out of the phase of people that were the subtle influences on what's to come. And I think we're starting to get into the real brunt attack of modernism, um, which would be Manet. And uh, um, I mean, uh, what do you think of that? I mean, I, my feelings is, is that when you hit Manet, you've kind of passed over the threshold 100%. And you're, you're now in like, true full-on modern painting as opposed to like being pre-modern you're saying yeah like, like a corbet a corot there's a lot of information in there that leads to modernism and they're the first inklings of modernism but i find manet to be kind of a breaking point of you know what this is now we're all in yeah i think i think i would agree with that or at least at least you know beyond towing the line you know what yes. i mean from pre to, to full-fledged modernism so yeah, I, would I would agree with you. So uh, he's de we're going to find that he's definitely uh, a controversial figure, right? He's yeah, um, definitely a great painter, and he did a lot of painting in a short lifetime. Uh, well, relatively short lifetime, I guess. And then, uh, and then um, he's he's one of those painters that I, when you and I were dreaming up how to get the show done it's tough to narrow down the paintings. I mean, yes. it, it, we're coming into an era of painters where you sit there and go, there's not that one or two famous paintings. There are, when you hit man a, uh, even for people that are not deep in the arts, there are many, many paintings that are man a's that everyone knows. So, uh, so even narrowing the field of what to talk about is tough. Um, but, uh, he's, um, a little later, he was born in the 1830s. So we're starting to see the the generation slide forward here some, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and he was uh, very active. He he was born into a more uh, affluential family, very politically minded family. His father was a judge. Um, he was actually on track. That well, his family wanted him to be a lawyer, and uh, he ended up uh, going another way, being a famous painter, right? <laughs> Oh, always the right choice, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes a difficult one. For yeah, the that's right. And um, and ultimately uh, became a painter. And uh, because of his uh, family wealth and because of their connections, uh, he he knew the right people and and he did very well for himself uh, from all accounts that I can find. Um, very different from like a Dumier situation, who really had to uh, pull himself through most of his life. Um, so with that, he, he, you know, submitted to salons. He participated like you would expect a, a working active painter of the time to participate. Um, but he was radical in his thinking. Uh, and I think what we're going to find is his niche really watered down into a nutshell was being able to reference art history and be able to show people that he was knowledgeable about painting but then put in a controversial modern spin on it 
and it would shock people and, and make them start, you know, the buzz would be created about the paintings. Mm -hmm. um, but there was no doubt that he was knowledgeable of the subject matter that he was talking about. And I think that that really, you can, you can say he stole some of that from Corbet because Corbet did some of that. But I think Manet did it more upfront and, and personal. And it took, and, it, took it a, a bit further as well. Yes, yeah. I mean, a, a lot of a lot of Manet's pictures, and one of them in particular that we'll see towards the end here, were pretty well. Actually, three of the ones we're going to talk about were almost like frontal assaults on the culture of the time. And uh, and they're the kind of pictures that today a person from today looking at them, if they had no knowledge of it, would have no idea. They would just think it was just just a picture of a lady at a bar or, or whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, and then when you dive into the culture of the time and what he was painting about and the kind of lifestyle he had and stuff, it was it was a commentary of the social aspects of the time, mm -hmm. um, which definitely puts him in a new category. Um, so, so for those who have been following along, this is where we start homogenizing the Courbet philosophies, the Dumier political things you're, you're starting to see some of these pieces come together and how they influence these these younger groups of painters you know so um uh we should just go ahead and start i guess because we got a good amount of paintings of his to talk about <laughs> right, if, you're, right. if you're down with that we'll start with the uh with the luncheon in the park um which is a fantastic painting I'm bringing it up here now and uh, do you want to talk a little bit about this dennis well, I was hoping you would, but uh, okay, no, I can't. I mean, there's, okay. uh, there's historical references, obviously, in here. Um, I, I think I'm, I'm, I want to kind of gloss over that. I'll, I'll let you touch on that if you want to. Sure. But what what ended up being very controversial about this, obviously, is that it's clothed men around a, a nude female, and uh, it was rejected by the by the uh, salon, yep. but accepted by what the the, the sort of I guess in the particular year he entered it to the salon, there were, I, I want to say, four thousand or something yeah. entries, and so it was a it was a, an incredibly big year for the salon. So of course there were more rejections, right? Um, and so these people got together and created their own exhibit, you know, uh, of all the rejected uh, pieces, and, and this of course was one of them. Right. Would it have been? Uh, rejected any other year it's hard to say it was again like i said because of what it is i think it, it did it did uh offend people in some ways just just because of the subject matter but it does show all the things that we've talked about to set this up his history is, is definitely present his uh his treatment of the paint very loose and and i don't want to use the word crude but but you know it's it's about the paint yeah. Um, and that's a very modern characteristic. Um, well, let's so. let's talk about the paint just for a second, uh, and I and not to not to cut you off, but I think that's a a place worth diving into for a second with Manet, because mm -hmm. um, Manet was definitely. I mean, it, it's it's very well known that he liked Velasquez, which we have not talked about in a previous series uh, mm -hmm. at all. And and there is the debate that maybe we should have thrown him in there somewhere, you know, but. But it was a different style of painting than what a Courbet was doing, and what a definitely different from Corot. You know what I mean? Um, but the the manner of of how to create people and use colors and things was more of a Spanish um, influence than a French influence, right? Mm -hmm. And well, yeah, um, yeah. There's, but it goes beyond that. I mean, it goes back. Really, truthfully, I, I think some of the influence that he, you know, some of his his historic knowledge, or you know, it goes back to the Renaissance. He, he's oh, he's yeah. well informed back to then. Yes. And, and and borrowing from things all the way that far back. Well, I was thinking like, and when I say Spanish, I meant like the treatment of like how the skin tones are and how oh, they're okay. represented. The the way that the the tactileness of the of the figures is different from how the French would attack a figure. You know, this is definitely not coming from an Ang way of looking at a figure. This is definitely coming more from a, a Velasquez and, 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 and actually some Dutch, you know, way of, of representing figures and stuff. Um, but I do agree with you. The setup 
and the postures and things like that, you're exactly right. They harken right back, like direct lineage back to Renaissance painting. Mm -hmm. So, anyways, that, my, that was my little diatribe into that part. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a lot. I mean, it's a, there's so much to talk about in just this one painting. And this is one of his earlier things. Not the earliest, but it's one of the earlier ones. So, it, you know, it only goes on from this. You know, this, yeah. is, this, the, this is just the... I don't know, the, the, the beginning for him. Well, the, the characters in this painting, um, from what I've read up on, one is his future brother-in-law, one is his, at the time, future wife, right? Uh, yeah. And then one was like a quasi-celebrity in like the Paris scene, uh, a, a well-known model who, who would be in many paintings and actually were in several of his paintings. Um, but uh, this, the, the shock value is maybe what we should focus on for a minute as far as people understanding because, again, I think if somebody saw this today, they wouldn't be super shocked because, yes, there's a nude, but it's not like it's exposed in some radical way or anything like that. But this was more the fact that it was so... It, it's represented... You've got these dressed males who are lounging out in public for and and in the way that it's being presented out in public where there are many other people mm -hmm. um, casually talking to someone who is completely naked and I think that that was the part that became shocking um, for the time because that would have been obviously completely unacceptable and uh, and we might as well start trespassing onto this now is that uh, there was an issue with prostitution in France at the time um, as far as it being just absolutely permeated in, in uh, you know, in um, the culture of inner cities and stuff. And some of this ties to that, and we will see later paintings that we'll even discuss here that really kind of incorporate this kind of uh, frontal, you know, the, a person at the time would have gotten a message about prostitution in an image like this, you know. It would have definitely spoken to that issue of the time. And and that's it would have been offensive. People would have walked up and been like, Well, geez, we don't need to we don't need to talk about this. You know what I mean? It'd be I, I equate it to I equate it to us watching a movie that's supposed to be for entertainment, you know. Two hundred years from now someone's gonna say, Oh yeah, they watched movies for entertainment and then the movie you watched is some movie about drug culture and cops shooting everybody and, and all that other stuff. And someone a hundred years from now, who would not understand at all what we're talking about, would be like, why would that be entertaining at all? Like, it's it's like the worst part of their culture. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is this is a little bit of that flavor, if you ask me. This was kind of an edgy thing at the time to, to put in. It, it, I would even yeah take it further. I mean, if you if you think to today, there there's. A number of people today that would still be like, I, I don't see, I don't get it. You know what? Why would anybody paint this? Why, right. why? You know, doesn't it doesn't speak to anything good? <laughs> right. Okay. I mean, it's a painting. It's it's. Uh, I think he did it to, too. I think there's a bit of shock value that he he went for with this, but. You know, I do think even today there's plenty of people that have that feel like they're offended even yet, even yet a what is it, 150 years later? Yeah. So, no, 160 I, I, years later, I think. I could see that. Yeah. So, so this was like you had said, this was an early painting for him. This was was this his first salon entry? I think it was. I think so. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I can't if he had one that, before. But I think so. If he had one before, it didn't have the splash that this one had. There was, well, yeah, and, and some of his earlier, even earlier pieces were really, they weren't, they, they, they maybe touched on history, but they, they weren't, um, there, there was nothing overly, you know, controversial involved. So I right. think that was the step for him. Well, and, and we will see as we move on to the next one here that that becomes kind of a thing for him. Yeah. So the next one, if we're ready to move on, are you, is there anything else you want to talk about with that one? No, I think, but I, but I, I would just like to say that I, ha, you know, I, I think we're kind of leaning. We're not saying it in so many words, but I think we're leaning towards it. We're, we're going. There is going to be a series, a series of recurring themes here that we're going to, oh yeah, you know, dealing with. So yeah. Yeah, I mean, 
he is a he is a and again I'm trying to equate it for someone today, but he's kind of a Quentin Tarantino type person of the time where where you can tell he's artistically talented and stuff, but he always seems to want to shock you with something socially at the same time, you know. Exactly. Um, yeah. And, and, then, and I don't and, want to demean and, and Man A. The by historic the way. references and everything that he does, it just it just emphasizes the the intellect of him and what what in, what in what he put into each of these things, which is which is yeah. kind of the the irony of it in a way. Yes. I, I and I gotta say, of guys of this time doing these scenes, and and you know, I don't want anybody to get like upset that I'm thinking other painters don't think about it as much. But when you read about the paintings that Manet makes throughout his career, there's a lot of dense um, story as far as commentary. There's a you know for for being things of a modern era, there's a lot of purposeful composition that you may not see later as much. You know what I mean? Some some things become a little more ragtag later of people going, oh, I just worked with the picture and things like that. And Manet is still kind of of that bridge era where everything in the piece means something, right? You know, right, and there's right. a lot of symbolism. Not, not only still that, going on. but there's like there's everything he brings to it before he even starts it, right? I mean, yeah. the, the historic references are are something that he's he's researched and and got all put together before he even begins to compose it. Exactly. So he, it's, he's definitely it's a pretty no dark dense. I think it dense is a good word. Yeah. So um, so let's bring up uh, Olympia. <laughs> There's a great one for the kids, right? <laughs> so, so um, I mean, talk about this one. This one's definitely controversial. There was a bit of a an audio cutout on my end. You, you're, we are. I didn't even hear the painting we're talking oh, about. We're talking Olympia. about the, the the Olympia. Yeah. So uh, I was I was saying this one's definitely a controversial painting. Oh, definitely, yeah. And uh, why don't you talk about this a little bit? Well, it's a, it's a that it takes a, a what is it a Titian painting, right? A, yep. a historic painting tries to put it into the context a, a bit a, more of a social context of their time of, yep. of Manet's time, which of course puts this figure out of place already, right? A, a nude figure being uh, served. By uh, some kind of servant, I'm, I'm, I'm. I think she's bringing flowers or something to her. But it, it's, it's shocking. I mean, I, I, I think, again, it's another one of those things where if this were painted today, I, I think you know maybe fewer people would be offended by it. Fewer people would even see it. But, but at that time, I have to believe that that was you know for one, you don't. He, he's almost. I think they may have seen it as some kind of desecration towards the history of art. You know. I would agree. Yeah, I would I would agree with that because because this pose, this particular pose that we're looking at here, was actually it, it had become kind of a traditional motif, right? I mean, because Goya did one like this. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Goya did a Goya did an Olympia type painting, and then you're right, it comes from a Titian, right? Mm -hmm. You had reclining nudes in like I mean Corbet did some of these that were not really public art they were more private commissions but he did reclining nudes in similar fashion but but they weren't considered salon worthy they were for someone's commission you know and uh, and I you know this is this is again a prostitute and and anyone looking at it at Manet's time would know it was a prostitute I mean, because of the way she, because of the flower, because of the necklace thing, you know, the choker thing. There's a a few things that are subtle at the time. The shoes in bed. The, the, there's there's a lot of sexual power going on here. That's not not the reason historically you did a reclining nude. <laughs> exactly right. So well, so and the, just the the the, the classic female body is is not is not present here it's uh you know when you think of the the renaissance or the or um or titian's titian's women i mean they're not they're not they're not quite this type of body no you're exactly right well they're also not judging you by staring at you like they're ready to get something done <laughs> <laughs> and and hey, I mean I don't know how else to say it, but that is a part of this. That is a part of what's controversial about this painting. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. is, there, that, yeah, absolutely. is that if someone looked at older nudes from the old days type thing, they're not confronting the viewer. They're not they're not staring back at you like like, yeah, I'm here and I'm and I'm nude. You know what I mean? Right. They they are either they are either sleeping or they're or they're engaged in they're reading a book or they're or they're one of my favorites from Corbet is, you know, the the um the you know, handling a dove and things like that. But there there are always these these you you are catching them in a, in a in a moment that is some it could be perceived as innocent and you happen to walk in on them. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. This is not that. <laughs> this is a woman who knows you're looking at her and she's looking back at you. <laughs> I mean, that's that's what we're talking about here, right? So so at the time, and this is the part where again, just to relate it to people today. At the time, your crowd walking through the salon to see this are very, very aware of the Titian painting. They're very aware of the Goya painting. They're very aware of reclining nudes uh, having a historical, you know, vision of what they normally have. And this is not it. <laughs> this is this is not part of that. And that's why it would be shocking. I would say. I mean that that that's that's my take on this, you know. I, Even down to like the details he included, I, I can't quite see from the image we're working with here, but it looks like there's like a black cat or something on the edge of the bed, right? In the Titian painting, there's a little dog curled up sleeping, a little you know puppy-like dog. Uh, I don't know, maybe some kind of spaniel or something curled right. up on the bed and here we have a black cat standing kind of looking at you right it, it, it's just it's funny the little details that he pulled out from that painting to kind of play on in this one yeah he he definitely and and again this is where this is why we call it a masterpiece he knew what he was doing it wasn't like he was just trying to mimic the titian and did it wrong he was intentionally doing these things to create a stir as to what he was getting at you know Mm -hmm. So it's a fantastic painting, by the way. But but it's still, I, I think you're right, Dennis. When I don't think I, in terms of like an art museum, it's not offensive today to someone. But in terms of something that would be in like a an office building or your house or something, it's still kind of an offensive, kind of a an uncomfortable painting to look at. Yeah, yeah. So uh, which, which is really amazing now that we've talked about it a little bit because it's kind of like wow that that is the power of making a piece like this is that it, it lives on with that same kind of inertia of of being problematic to the viewer you know yeah it's almost like he sort of went after things that were timeless in terms of um you know socially th these are things that he probably figured were always going to be socially awkward or socially uncomfortable things yeah. and 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 went after them in such a way <laughs> that even this this far away from the time of them being painting painted we could still see some of that you know we still feel some of that yeah yeah i i agree with that 100 percent. so all right well good let's uh let's move on to the next painting which actually i'm going to show two for the viewers watching here that are kind of in quick succession because they're they're the maximilian paintings the execution paintings Mm -hmm. And um, one's a tight painting, and, and like I said, I'll, I'll have one up quickly, and then I'll have the other one up. But I'm going to leave the, the looser one up for us to talk about. Um, so, uh, and I'm, I can't say that I'm an expert on the scene of this. I don't know if you know more about it than I do. I know that it was during um, the war there, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a war painting, yeah. And, and they were executing... Um, um, the Emperor Maximilian. Right, and uh, I've always been locked in on the on the contrast of the styles between the first one and the second one. Well, um, wasn't the first one more of a sketch leading up to? That's why I understand it. He did these. He did several versions of this uh, sort of sketchy, kind of working out some details before he got to that that final, you know, more finished looking one. Okay. Well, well, ironically, so so the tighter one is the one delivered as the final piece. Right, right. Uh, ironically, when I was in school, we always studied the looser one that I'm showing here <laughs> as as a wonderful Manet painting. To be honest with you, even though it was just a study, because um, I remember I remember looking at that many, 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 many times. 
Um, but let, let's talk about this one. I mean, it's uh, in general, it's a more of a obviously a political painting, right? Because it's about an execution of, of the emperor. Um, in the finished piece, there are people watching over the wall. There's very, very loose attempt at like some landscaping in the back and stuff, but really the meat of the scene is from the wall forward, obviously. And uh, it still kind of has this, there's a lot of things in here that in my mind are, are very much Manet-isms. Like the, the stance of, if you look at the soldier to the furthest left, this is on the Titan one that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. He very much has the standing pose that Manet uses a lot for like boys holding things or, or men standing in, in a painting if they were just standing as a figure for him to paint. They often have this um, right angle, their feet are at this right angle and you know it's a pose that's very Spanish if you ask me. I, I, I think of older Spanish paintings when I see stuff like that mm -hmm. um, and less about French you know. Um, but the colors are very much Manet. He still he was one of those painters that even though he was borderline, you know, he was. Many people will say he, he was an impressionist, but he had that he had kind of like a little life pre-impressionism in in the painting market where he was still using a lot of blacks and a lot of dark earth tones and and things like that. And this is a good representation of that kind of work for him. What what's your thoughts on this? Well, you know, I'm, 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 there's a, it, it's another one of these situations where you know he, he really thought out every square inch of how this is laid yeah. out, and, and I appreciate all of that for sure. I mean, it, it's, it's, I, I, I don't even know what it could have been, or, or you know, I mean, there's so many, there's so many things he probably make. That's the great thing about great composition is it, is it just, it just feels like it was. Meant to be. Done and then that was right and, and whatever else, but just to the to fact, you know, you can tell between the sketch and the final one there that that he dis, he was on the fence about showing that wall in the back and how much to show and and yeah and 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 the choice to shoot, to show the people kind of peering over the wall and watching this happen, you know, that's a pretty strong decision to make. That is. And as you pointed out, the stance of the of the figures, even the other people being executed, right? It, it's all it's all pretty, it's all pretty telling, you know. These things all kind of say stuff. Yeah. Um, the, the mark the mark making is very specific. Also, for for a guy who is you know bundled in with impressionists and is and is can be a very loose painter as you saw in the sketch, you know. And, and we know it's a sketch, so that's it's a little different. But when we get to like the uh, some of these other paintings that we're about to see, they they definitely become looser even in the figurative you know aspects. Um, but this is, I mean, when you look at those belts, you look at the middle person being executed, how his pants work into underneath the coat and everything, mm -hmm. that's all That's all pretty tight painting for right. for what we consider a Manet, you know? Now, now it, it's very, very right on par with, like, the Olympia that we just saw, because that was a very tight painting, too. For I mean, looser than what the realists and before would be thinking of, but, but still much tighter than an Impressionist-type painting. I think we should also um, point out that it's uh, the size that we see on the screen. Of course, doesn't do it any justice because this That's one true. is incredibly large, right? So, so the nature of looking at something large scaled down to something we could see on a computer screen is going to make it kind of naturally look a bit tighter yes. than if you were actually, you know, standing in front of it and seeing it as large as it is. And and a, and a good point is that that sketch we showed also is very large. Okay. Which is which is, makes it that much crazier to look at, you know? Right, and the the. The other thing I would like to point out is we see this, you know, the, this is a great, this this kind of shows you the, the whole modernist, you know, the very modernist part of, of Monet in that today, you know, you pointed out that you more looked at the sketch in art, in art history class yeah. than you did the final painting. And I think that in today's world or in, in the world of modernism itself, that that's very acceptable, right? Because it's about the paint. It's... It's it's showing you you're not he's not trying to trick anybody here he's he's very blatant about the fact that he's got brush strokes and this is all about the paint is all it is, and I think you know as time goes on, with painting we're more we're more accepting to that now he's in this time where that's that's kind of just becoming, 
acceptable. So he's he's done this other final, more finished-looking painting, which doesn't ha doesn't really hide any of of the fact that there's paint. You know, he's not trying to hide it right. any more so, but it but it is it is tighter and maybe in, in, done in a more acceptable, common way. You know, I, I think maybe he did the sketches for him and and the final to please others more than more so oh, yeah. i'm guessing yeah. this is all kind of my opinion but no no that i i think that that's very true and you're right is that our our consideration of his sketch as an important piece still is really hindsight it, it's us knowing he was an important figure to art and we're we're going over everything he made you know what i mean mm -hmm. and you're, you're exactly right if that if that sketch was released today it would have no doubt someone could easily say oh it's, it's the finished piece Without any problem, mm -hmm. I mean, no one would ever, ever question if it was the finished piece or not. You know, so that's, that's a very good point. Uh, this is still a transitional period that we're talking about that he's in, where uh, and and I know we've said this in past episodes, but photography is still brand new, mm -hmm. still still a young, developing, you know, um, uh, starting to get out to the masses, but it's still a kind of a rich person sport, if you will. And uh, and paintings and, and printmaking, like we saw the Dumier and stuff, it's all kind of changing. Like how they're, you know, this is what is exciting about modernism is the reason to paint is becoming different. It's, it's changing as to why you paint. And it's not just because the Pope gave you a, a thousand bucks. And it's not just because, you know, that, that uh, some of these have motives beyond just a commission just to make money or just to record something mm -hmm. they have motives that are more about the artists and about them talking about the world around them and this is what makes modern painting exciting it doesn't mean it's more exciting or less exciting than other kinds of paintings but it has its own kind of feel to it mm -hmm. that you didn't have before it so let's um let's move to um the picture, and I'm about to bring it up here, and I'm, I, forgive me, I've got to remember the name of it. It's like the train station, or the, let's see, it's called... It's one of his later pieces. Yeah. The, the Railway, maybe? The Railway, yep, thank you. 1872, so it's definitely one of his later pieces. Um, well, it couldn't be 18... That's what it says here. Oh, okay, okay, all right. All right. So, so I, this that, is... He, he died in 1883, right? Yeah. So, so this is, um, if someone, uh, to me, this is the kind of thing that you find on the Impressionist 14-month calendar, right? As <laughs> representative of Manet, right? And, and it's a little ironic to me because, one, you know, this is a soft, softer scene for Manet than what I normally uh, relay in my mind as a Manet painting. But... This is one of those paintings that has a lot of hidden information. This is the reason I wanted to bring it up, is that to your point, Dennis, of him, you know, being very dense, being very, very thoughtful of all the things going on. So later, uh, just to just to take us out of the stream of consciousness for a minute, later, you know, you're going to see Monet, you're going to see Renoir, you're going to see other people, and they're not much later. They're 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 all parallel here in some fashion. They overlay each other. Mm -hmm. But you're going to see some other guys who do scenes like this, and they're strictly worried about light, form, you know, the 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 ephemeral moment. You're going to hear us say that a lot, right? Yeah, and and color. I mean, and, and color. And, and it's like it becomes somewhat of a science, right? Exactly. Very much, very much about making the image, though. This is where Manet is different. Someone could look at this and say, "Oh, this is like those other guys," but this is different. This is a girl staring through the bars at a train station, right? Mm hmm And again, this is very, very specific to the time. Trains were a were new to France. They had just put in a aqueduct system. They're using boats for a lot of stuff. And they were late to the game of getting trains. And trains were like a new technology. This would be like you and I this would be like you and I watching a shuttle launch today you know what i mean mm -hmm. it, w it was kind of a a point of fascination and then of course you've got more of the story ish part of it of the girl looking at the train as if it's like a mode of escape and she's of course behind bars there, there's typical of manet 
there's a much more elaborate thing going on than just a picture of a girl looking through some bars. And that's the part that, for those of you out there that are interested in that kind of thing, the story behind the painting, Manet is a great, great painter to go read about. <laughs> he really, he's, he's more exciting in that regard than some of the other painters. And, um, and this, I mean, there are many, many articles about this painting. And it's one of those paintings, in my mind, if you looked at it and knew none of that, it would just seem like a quick, simple painting that he happened to be on the spot for. Mm -hmm. But there's really a lot to it. He's an artist, I would say, who not only did his homework before he started his piece, but then decided to let that research lead to other research and lead to other research. You know, he he, yes. he, he probably nearly exhausted his his digging before he actually sat down and, and started uh, piecing things together. Yeah, he he was definitely a thinking man's painter. He very much so. You know, I mean, I I don't. I don't think that um, my, and again, I don't know this, and, and this is where we always have to acknowledge you and I are just two painters giving our opinions, you know, but but I don't ever think of Manet as that guy that was the flippant, I just felt like I had to use this color kind of guy. He was a calculated, very, very well-informed, well, you know, laid his plans well before he started executing these paintings. I would love to see him in one of one of the college critiques, because I'm sure he could field every question about what he had done from any from any critiquer. Oh yeah, He'd have an answer for every a well thought out, truthful answer to whatever question uh, a reviewer might have on yeah. his work. Well, and I'm sure some of that comes from being the son of a judge. <laughs> right. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, that might yeah. be part of his nature. You're right. So, anyways, he that's he, was, he said he was on the path to become an attorney too, right? So that's sort of how they do their work too. It's all yeah, about yeah. Early on, that's work. that's what his family wanted him to do, and then he he just wasn't feeling it, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, so now we've got to get to the the final piece um, that we're going to talk about here, and I I caution everybody: there's definitely plenty more pieces of Manet that are definitely worth looking at and and investing a little bit of time in. But um, the final piece is the bar at the Foyles Brugere. And uh, this is right before he died, right? Because um, this is 1882, it says. Yeah, yeah. So this is one of the last things he did. And this is a whopper, <laughs> if you ask me. This is one of his best paintings, in my opinion. It's um, potent. What's that? It's very potent. It is, it is definitely potent. So let's get the obvious thing that every kid off the every college student who binge drinks gets out right away, which is that those are bass ales <laughs> <laughs> on the countertop, and everybody loves that, right? But yeah. but uh, that is how old bass ale is <laughs> is that Manet put them in a painting. But uh, but more more important is that this is a um, this is a my my earlier term of frontal assault on the social atmosphere in France at the time and in Paris in particular this there is no greater piece in the Manet repertoire than this one as far as being a frontal assault because you are literally face to face with a what what really is somebody would have known at the time as a call girl and uh, and not only that but because of the way he worked the mirror, you actually are forced to see yourself, the viewer, which is the gentleman in the top hat, and you're basically approaching a prostitute, <laughs> is what you're doing. And, and this was highly, highly offensive at the time. This was a slap in the face of, of the gentleman of the time. And, and exposing this whole subculture of, of the Parisian nightlife and everything. I mean, this was a, a very, very potent statement, like you said, Dennis, to make. Mm -hmm. um, now, it's a beautiful piece. It's got a lot of wonderful aesthetical things to do with it. I mean, this is, this is him really kind of uh, playing in that impressionist arena more than some of his other pieces. Um, but I still think this is you know, more dense, more um, spatially complicated than some of those other ones. I mean, why don't you speak to it a little bit? I mean, what do you, what do you see in? Well, the, the, 
the reflection, right, is a big part of it. And what yeah. he's done with this reflection behind the barmaid behind the bar, right? Yeah. So now you can see who's on the other side of the bar, not just all those people sitting back there, you know, enjoying the nightlife. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of... There's a lot of this is something I think that was kind of present in his early work too. Was that he would he did an awful lot of people in some yeah. of his pieces. Um, so he's he's kind of giving you a flavor, you know, giving you an, an overview of, of what things were like in that regard in terms of nightlife, like you said. But how he's composed this reflection, I think, is really interesting because if you stood in front of a bar and you were looking straight across like like we are, right, the only way that you would see the backside of her at that angle is if the mirror were at an angle, right? Yes. So he's, he's intentionally distorted this in such a way that, you, that you, you're forced to see more of that than, than you would, right? Because the, the reflection would would be straight behind her more so, which would potentially obscure y your reflection of yourself, right? Correct. So he says, how am I going to make this work? And, he's, and he sort of shifts everything as if the mirror were at an angle. And I don't, I, I, I'm looking at the reflection of the bar behind her, and it's straight. It, so exactly. I'm thinking well, I was, that that's I was not just how it was. Say that. Yeah. So he's definitely made a conscious decision to do this. Yeah. And again, it's, it's for that very reason that, that you pointed out. I think he, <laughs> he wants... The viewer to feel like that they're, they're the one approaching this this barmaid and i'm gonna leave it at barmaid but you know yeah, yeah. fill in where, whatever you want there beyond well that. well i mean but dennis at the time this this would have not been the way you would have expected the barmaid to be if it was you know what i mean that th this is a person who has some symbolism attached to her that that exceeds the the cultural status of a barmaid yeah, absolutely, but but it's all, you know. I think he's he's looping it together, right? He's kind oh, yeah. of he's he's piecing this whole this whole lifestyle together. I think. I I agree with you. Yeah, I agree. Oh. With you. And the other part of it too, and maybe this is just me reading into things. That that's my job here. I think. Right. Yep. She's not exactly a. Uh, a non-endowed woman. I mean, I'm not just looking. I'm, I'm talking, you know, between the hips, between everything else. She's she's well figured, right? And yep. it's not like we're looking at something that's not supposed to raise, you know, get a man's blood pumping a little bit. <laughs> no, I I I agree. She she's uh, this is not your your Flemish paintings from 200 years earlier where the barmaids are all 300 uh, pound women. Right. This is this is definitely a woman who's meant to to again. She's frontally, you know, um, she's leaning on the bar. She's looking you dead in the face. She's an attractive woman, you know, and 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 she's dressed in a way that would be reminiscent of someone who is not necessarily just a barmaid. There's a lot of there's a lot of things that a person, especially of the 1880s would have read into this person yeah like, like you talked about the collar on the on the uh olympia painting yeah. she's got uh maybe a slightly different type of yep neck dressing we'll call it yes but the other thing that i want to point out too is this the facial expression what does that say you know what is it what does that look that she has staring back at you say <laughs> it doesn't say you know how may I help you? <laughs> right, right. No, this it doesn't is, give you this that like a, service with a smile, right? It's it's a very serious, uh, I don't know, tired look almost. Yeah, well, there you go. I I think that you're right. I think that this is this is not the best part of her night. <laughs> this, no, but you know what I'm saying is this is this is a job. That's another thing that I think reads feeds into the aura of what he's portraying here, which is this is a job and she's sick and tired of it. This is not really what she wanted for her life, mm -hmm. you know. That kind and of this thing. leads and, me and to someone say, who we're probably going to come to very soon in this series, which would be Toulouse Lautrec, where he did his whole series of of prostitutes and was very in your face about it. And and a lot of what you see in those is the same type of thing, right? Oh, yeah. I'm just tired of this, you know. Yeah. Well, and so and, it's it's kind of a it's funny that this precludes that in some ways, but I have to believe that it had a, it had a. It had a place in to in Toulouse Lautrec's mind as well. Yeah, well, it, it was, it, and not to not to veer off too much, but you know, Lautrec was uh, was kind of an outcast himself. 
So mm-hmm. he was he was kind of at home in that environment. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I think I think he normalized that for himself. Where I think Man A took it from a different place because Man A was more of an elitist class, mm-hmm. not elitist, but but well off, you know. Well, Lechek was as well. I mean, he was definitely from a, a, a upper class family, which six, which you know, we'll get into that when we talk about him. But yeah. his uh, his. But he had some physical problems. His physical problems were based on uh, inbreeding, because the upper classes stayed within the upper classes, and that caused yeah. that caused inbreeding in his family, and that's where he ended up with some of his physical problems. I, I think we've queued up what our next one's going to be. I think so too. <laughs> I, I, that just makes sense to me to go. It, it does. But, but actually. you know, I'm not sure that we. We'll have to do some research. There's also many of the impressionists that we could talk about between him and, and yeah. this. So it's we'll yeah. talk about it. We'll have it. to figure it out. But but definitely a teaser for Lutrec. But we'll do- speaking of inbreeding, we can't come finish. Up very often. <laughs> we can't finish a man A without bringing up the fun fact that you found out that yeah. I had never heard before. So go ahead. Oh, uh, his wife, the woman he married, was. Uh, may or may not have been well fathered a child before they were married so she fathered a child out of wedlock that may have been his child but it may have been his father's child so so he married a woman that may have been a, a mistress. mistress to his father yeah that is um that's putting him like his his that's putting his interest in scandal from into from the painting world into his real world or vice versa, right? I mean, it, it really he's is. got this controversial aspect in both his real life and in his paintings. Well, and it actually, I mean, just knowing that almost confuses me because there's there's a, a little sense of some of these pictures that he that we've shown here, where he's trying to be telling and didactic or for social change or something like that. You know what I mean? Right. And then you kind of have. A piece of information like that, which is why it's always important to understand who the artist was, right? Right, right. Where, where you're kind of like, well, maybe it wasn't because he obviously had some weird motives going on behind the scene, also. So, um, a, a definitely a strange, uh, a, a interesting twist for the Manet story. <laughs> well, maybe uh, you know, I'll do a little reading, and uh, if I find anything different or any clarification or any confirmation. Yeah. Of any of these things, I, I, I uh, we'll, we'll have a little footnote at the beginning of the next one. How's that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and we can always update the web page too with that stuff. You know. Okay. Good. Good. But um, but uh, let's. Uh, I mean, we're a little bit of over time, but we knew we would because Manet is a really big figure. Um, yeah. what uh, I mean, any closing arguments as far as you know, like obviously the the, um impact of Manet is gigantic all the way up to all the way up to you and I today uh, looking at it he's he is a definitely a driver for people going to museums and still studying work um, but what what you know closing discussion as far as uh, the importance of them and, and what we're going to see come out of this now that we've looked at the Manets. Uh, well, that's that's where I want to go with it. I mean, we've talked about some of uh, his historic reference, which I think is is incredibly important. You mentioned, I, I I don't even know if we actually said Goya. I think we did, right? Yeah, yeah. So we bring up Goya when we're talking about the war stuff. But well, uh, either way, but you yeah. said Vasquez. Uh, I think Goya is another one. A lot of the Spanish painters were a big part of it. But he goes all the way back. I mean, I mean, obviously, like I said, the 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 Olympia painting is clearly taken right from Venus of Urbino, so that goes way back to Titian. But I'd like to actually mention now what we think is his uh, footprint that he laid out for other artists, you know, going forward. Like, yep. like I actually see Cezanne in a lot of this, so especially the figurative treatment. I do too. Yep. Well, the the pushing and 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 you know I'm a Cezanne freak, so I'm almost afraid to say anything, but. But uh, the pushing of the line, like Olympia, the pushing of the edge out to the out to the end of the body and stuff. That's very. You will see Cezanne steal that later mm-hmm. on. There's and and if we could talk even you know you mentioned Renoir when you talked about the the railway painting and um, you know Monet is, is one I can see even in the earlier you know Monet's earlier work is similar to a lot of Monet's work and um, he clearly goes off a whole. A whole different direction after that, but right. 
the there's so many people I think you could you could say you know had some influence from him on yeah. that's what's amazing about him to me yeah I, I think his earlier work I see a lot of Degas uh, with and, and, and I and I would say that Degas is more a contemporary with Manet than Degas is normal with the rest of the Impressionists and, and then you can go beyond beyond that to like post impressionists. I mean, there's no there's no question that that Matisse was was not looking at this stuff because he's he's using some of the subjects, right? Yes. He's he's done work with some of the subject matter, the same similar subject matter as 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 did Cezanne. Yes. Yep. So it's it's clear that they all they all took from his, they all I don't want to say borrowed, but they they were drawn to his uh, interest in history and 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 yeah. re referencing. The past. Yeah, and I and I would make the claim that um, to drop the Picasso bomb is that you know talk about the ultimate you know art modern art history name drop is saying that Picasso is influenced by you, but but uh, the figures like in the execution and and the Olympia and things like that, I see that moving into some of Picasso's work of the of the Harlequins. And mm -hmm. the and the um, circus performers and stuff like that, a lot of the treatment has a similar weight to it, a similar feeling to it, and and of course Picasso was Spanish and he worked in Paris, so there's a lot of parallels there too. Manet had a lot of Spanish influence and he was French, so uh, but I I can I can see some of that happening too. Is is it when we eventually hear hit Picasso, which is down the road. But, it is, but these guys, you, as you mentioned, being in Paris, um, I, I have to believe that if they didn't directly cross paths, they crossed paths of others that crossed these paths. Oh, you know, yeah. so it, it, it's it's not it's not a stretch. Yeah, well, and the other thing that people that don't really study our history don't equate is that if Manet died in in 1880, what was it, 1884, something like that? 83, I think it said. 19, if he died in in the 1880s. Mm -hmm. Picasso was actively working in France in what 1912, something like that. Um, yeah, I, I think even maybe earlier. I thought 1905, maybe. I, but I, don't I mean, know. but we'll, we'll, people we'll... don't realize that the gap is that narrow. I mean, it's right. not like Picasso was just in the 50s or something. You know what I mean? Like Picasso is is shortly after this work, after after the lifespan of Manet. So it's not ridiculous whatsoever to think that Picasso would have had an immediate impact, uh, immediately interested in this kind of work. You know, it's not like it's not like uh, Picasso was doing history work to find Manet. It was still fresh work. Right, right. So Picasso would have been two years old when when uh, Manet, died. Manet died. So they so their their lives overlapped by two years. Yeah, which means they. It's safe to say they never spoke, but <laughs> their, their work is uh, their work is is close together, though. Yeah, that, well, that, and that's the point that I was making is is a lot of people think uh, when I talk to people that don't know much about painting, there's a lot of people that think that you know there's a 50 year gap between you know this kind of work and and uh, you know Picasso paintings. Only because they hear the name Picasso and they know he died in, in the 70s, you know? Well, in, 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 in their defense, Cubism is vastly different than anything that's going on right right at this point. Right? It Even is. In, into the 1880s. To, to envision that Cubism was coming was, like, just impossible. Yes. You know? but, but I guess the point I'm making um, is how fast this process of painting evolved. Exactly, and this time period—that's that's the important part about this time period. I think you're right. It it, it changed radically different in a very short uh, short period of time. Yeah, you had some crazy, crazy catalyst between between film, right? Because film definitely influenced Picasso, mm -hmm. and I mean movie film, not not photo. I'm sorry, photography, then film, and then um, and then the World Wars. All of those things radically change the landscape for all this kind of work in a very, very compressed amount of time. Yep. So, so, anyways, um, good. Well, this was a this was a full fledged. No, everybody got every penny out of it today. And they even got to hear about how the weather was. Uh, that's right. What, what might happen in the weather? The <laughs> that's that's good stuff. People like that stuff. So. <laughs>
All right, cool. Well, uh, well, no promises that Lutrec is the next one, but he will be shortly, though. I mean, he, yeah, I, I think that's got to happen. You're right that he is a stone throw as far as being contemporary and in the same realm. So, um, yep, I would agree with that. So, uh, okay, good. Well, thanks, Dennis. Um, that's it until next time. Thanks a lot. This is uh, Dennis Hart and Matt Foster with the Modern Art Family Tree. And now you know about Man A. <laughs> so. All right, thanks. I'll talk to you later, Dennis. Okay, thank you. See ya.